All right, so I wanna make a quick video to talk about security. I think this video is gonna be more for like beginners or juniors, but I don't know, maybe you'll learn something from my rambling from watching it if you're more experienced. So what are the traditional ways to protect your API? And I'm gonna also kind of talk about Next.js as well because a lot of my viewers use Next.js. So in all applications, you have a backend. There's code that only ever runs on the server. You have to have that because if you don't have that, there's no way to secure a database, right? You typically have a database over here and you can't just let users who are just floating around the internet, we'll call this a uh, script kitty. You can't just let users directly talk and basically destroy your database, okay? That's why we have a backend and typically this is called a REST API or you're using like, man, I don't know, TRPC or if you're using server actions or React server components. These things all run in the back end and they kind of act as the middleman to protect your data. This is the most important thing. The data, all the data you're storing in your application, you want to protect that. And so you put that behind it in an API. And the only way anyone can ever access this is by hitting your API. And this could be using curl, they could use Postman, they could just be hitting it from their browser. Okay. Now, I would probably always think that a user can just hit your APIs using whatever tooling that they want. So don't get into the idea that, oh, well, if they can't find the endpoint in the browser, they're not going to be able to hit it because they can still probably use curl to hit all these things and try to figure out how to get into your system. And in fact, I'm going to also put like a hacker here, a script kitty or a hacker, or maybe just a user. Sometimes users might hit your API endpoints on accident and your code has a vulnerability that causes a huge issue. Maybe they accidentally navigate to a page that they shouldn't navigate to. And then you just send back a bunch of user data that they should not have seen. So that's laying out the idea of like, we want to secure all the data that comes in of this database and out of this database so that certain users do not get access to it. So how do we do that? Well, typically you have an endpoint where you can log in. And when you log in, you might get back a token or you might set a session ID. So I'm gonna go ahead and say like JDBT or a session uh, I'll just say session ID, we'll put that in a cookie. So this right here, this is like the key to your house. The server creates a key, sends it over to the user after they log in, and then anyone who happens to have this key, whether that's the actual user or you, they leak that key and that gets to somebody else, whenever you send that key in, they basically can call any of your endpoints that are going to insert and read data from your database. So what does this mean? This means that anywhere that you are fetching data from the database, for example, if you're in Next.js land and you have a React server components and you're doing like a wait SQL and you run some SQL command, you better make sure that above that command, you are validating the session somehow. What does that mean? Well, again, you have like this thing that's gonna be sent over in the post request. Now, typically you'll do a post request and inside the headers, you'll have something called like an authorization and then you'll have like bearer and then you'll have the token. Granted, this is how you see it with JDBT, but if you're using like cookies, then you're just gonna see a cookie sent over in the header, right? That kind of is abstracted away from you because of how the browsers work. But just keep in mind that like this information, this, this key to your server is sent over in the post request. So what this means is that all throughout your code base, whether you're doing like a REST API, let's say you have like a to-dos endpoint, so slash to-dos, anywhere in your API that you potentially need to send back some data that is protected, you need to make sure that you're checking this. Now, what a lot of applications do is they'll use something called a middleware. Now, I would say don't confuse this term with what Next.js gives you. Protecting your routes with a middleware function is not the same as protecting your React server components that's fetching the data from your database and protecting your server actions that is inserting data typically to your database. Sorry, this talk's gonna be all over the place, but typically you'll have like your REST API, like API to-dos. And let's say this is like a post to create a new to-do. Before that, if you're using Hano or Express, you'll have a middleware function. And this middleware function is typically gonna check to make sure that, hey, the token that they're sending over in that post request, is it valid? Has it not expired yet? And by is it valid, there's two ways to check this. For JWT, typically you have like a, a JWT secret, and this will only live in your server. But you use the secret to verify that this thing that came over the wire if I use some crypto algorithm and check the hash, 
like, does the secret line up with this token? Like, do I know that I'm the person who generated this key? And if you verify it and it says, yes, this is actually correct, like this thing was signed with this secret, then you can trust it. And then you can go on to the next part of the process to call your API controller or something. But if it's not valid, then you definitely don't want to call this, right? You want to just end early and not allow this endpoint to be called because this is, again, this is a sensitive part where it runs your business logic. It might send out emails. It might call open AI and run up your AI bill. It might store stuff to your database. This is stuff that you want to make sure does not run unless you have a valid token or a valid session. Now, if you're dealing with sessions, it's the same idea. You're probably going to have a session stored somewhere. Like a session ID could be in Redis as like a caching mechanism. You could just store it in your database or whatever. It doesn't matter. You want to check that the session ID that comes over the wire, is it actually valid? Because these sessions should expire after some time. So check it. Make sure it's still there. If, it's, if it hasn't expired, then we can trust that yes, like we can just start doing the request. So this is like the overall idea of security and authentication, right? This is just authentication. We haven't talked about authorization. And this same thing applies. I know I kind of talked about Hano and Express here, but the same thing applies to a server action. Let's say you have like a my create to do action. Again, you should find some type of way to call a helper function before you even allow that Next.js server action to run. Like you should definitely have it call a util function. And this util function should check like get session and verify that the session that comes back is valid. Now, if you're using auth.js, like typically it's just a matter of calling a function and making sure that it returns a user object. And that's about it. If that thing does return a valid user, then you assume that, hey, everything's good. I can actually, you know, run the code that's inside of my server action. If not, you should probably have this action end early so it doesn't actually run anything. Now there's a couple libraries out there that help you write middlewares for server actions. I think I definitely recommend using those in your project. Like there's one called Next Safe Actions. There's also ZSA, which is another one that I've used on my starter kit. But the idea is anytime that you're going to fetch or retrieve data from this database, you better be checking the session. All right, hopefully that makes sense and you guys are paying attention, okay? All right, let's move on and talk about authorization. Now that we've checked the token and we know that this is a valid user, they could potentially send bad information to your action or your API endpoint, okay? They could have sent some bogus thing and said like, you know what, I wanna get access to to-do five. Like let's say this is a to-do list application and they have like to-dos and this is the to-do ID of five, but that might not belong to them. This user may only have access to like to-do ID of one. And so that's something that you need to add into your code, either your API endpoint or into your server action or into your React server component. You need to say, hey, I know that this is a valid user. They're trying to access to do five. Can you check? And typically the way we do this is in the database, you'll have a column called like user ID. And this user ID is how you map between a to do ID. So you might have like to do one, to do three, whatever. And this could be like Bob. This could be Bob and this could be Sally. Let's just go ahead and say like, this is a five, right? And if the person making the request happens to be user ID of Bob, but for some reason they put to do of five in here, you should be throwing an exception. Cause like, Hey, this person, Bob is trying to access to do five to do five does not belong to him. So you need to either when you fetch the data back from the database, like typically you'll go ahead and just say like, Hey, give me to do five. And this will be like the to-do model. And inside of that to-do model, it's going to have a user ID attached to it. And this to-do model might have a user ID of Sally. Okay, I know this is hard to read, but again, in your code, you need to do some authorization checks to say, hey, the person who made the request is Bob. The to-do I got back from my database says Sally. So I'm going to throw an exception and say, you do not have access to what you're trying to request. And there's different ways you can do this. I mean, you could have like an access control list or something like that. But honestly, like the, some of the easiest ways to do it is just like in your database query, if you're using SQL, in your where clause, just like put like where user ID is equal to Bob. Okay, this makes it easier if you're using like an ORM or SQL directly. You just basically say, you know what? Do not fetch anything from my database unless the user ID matches what came over in that token. But again, authorization is something that you have to craft yourself. You have to figure that out yourself unless you're using some type of like more inclusive full stack library that might have stuff like this built into it.
Okay, so we talked about securing with authentication. We talked about securing with authorization. And again, this can keep getting more complex. Instead of a user ID, you might have roles. This might be an admin. And so an admin has certain things that they should be able to do. For example, maybe an admin should have access to everything in your database. So then in your, your business logic, you should have helper functions that basically say, hey, if role is user, then do the normal flow of like, okay, check and make sure you append where user ID is equal to Bob. If role is equal to admin, don't append this. Just fetch the data, insert the data, like don't check this stuff. So role-based authorization, again, like you're just gonna have to write logic in here to just check the user role. And you should also assume that if the token was correctly verified, that the role that came over in the token, or maybe the role should be looked up. Like maybe you're using a session cookie and you need to look up the user from the database and look at their role. And then you can do some actions based on if the role set properly or not. And then you can add in Redis and add in caching because you want to speed it up and then you have to figure out a way to add in cache and validation if the user's roles can ever be changed somewhere in the system. It just gets more complex, but that's the overall idea, right? So you have authentication, you have authorization, and then all of your business logic will basically revolve around should that person have access to what he's trying to request. Okay, so let's talk about some other ways that you can secure this application. Again, remember this script kitty, he can send whatever he wants to over Postman. So every endpoint that you set up, you need to make sure that the data that's coming across the payload, for example, let's say they have like, you know, some JSON that they're sending over in the post request. So they might have like a prompt. Okay, let's just pretend that they have a prompt that they can send in. And this is just some string of stuff. What you want to do is on all of your API endpoints, all of your TRPC mutations, all of your Next.js server actions, the things that the user could potentially send in, and again, if this is a server action, you could have a prompt that looks like this. But remember, this is just a public endpoint. This thing is whatever they want it to be. And so you want to validate every single input that comes over from a, you know, the public. Now, why do you care about doing this? Because a user could potentially send in whatever they want here. So if you don't want them to send over 10,000 characters of a prompt, and then that just automatically gets stored directly into your database, well, you should probably do some type of validation here on the input and say, hey, if the prompt is over a thousand characters, maybe don't store it in the database because if a user decides that they want to just write a script to keep hitting your endpoint and they're going to send over a prompt that's a million characters and they just keep on hitting your endpoint and inserting millions and millions and millions and millions of characters into your database, that adds up. That costs money. That's going to cause performance issues when you have tons of things stored in your database. Granted, depending on the database, like SQL, you can have, you know, max length in place to prevent that. But typically your application business logic should run some type of validation to make sure that the data looks how you'd expect it to be. If this was an email, you should probably validate that it does match the structure of an email. Tons of different stuff you can do here for validation. Now this becomes even more important if you decide that the thing that they're storing in your database is going to be fetched back and displayed in your UI. Okay, so instead of a prompt, let's say they can actually store like some content and this could actually have some HTML in it. And so you don't want them to store that into your database. And then later that gets fetched back and that gets rendered out into the page because what they can do is in that HTML, they can go ahead and just put some, some script tags, right? They can just go ahead and say, you know, I'm going to put a script tag in here. And I'm going to do some bad stuff. So this can become dangerous because someone could just upload some bad script and store it into your database. And then when someone comes along who just, you know, is browsing your site, maybe you have like a blog and this person uploaded a bad blog post article. When that gets fetched back, any user who hits that page is going to see that content. And if you're not properly sanitizing, this is the, this is the key word, sanitizing the inputs to make sure that this script tag can no longer ever be saved into the database, then like people can do whatever they want with the UI and just start injecting HTML and doing some very bad stuff. So again, make sure that everything that comes over in the input, especially if you decide to display it later in your UI, has been sanitized in some way. So those are like the first lines of defenses. So now let's talk about more about infrastructure. Again, you can have one person write a script that keeps on hitting your API over and over and over again. And this can be very problematic. So what you typically do to prevent, uh, you know, issues, because if they keep hitting your API, it causes your server to do work. And the more work your server does, the less requests it can handle. 
And so if one person is just flooding your server with requests that might do some computation, but then your normal non-malicious users just can't even use your application anymore because this whole thing is just crawled to a halt because one person has hit found an endpoint that does a bunch of computation and he just keeps hitting it over and over again. So what we typically do is you add something called rate limiting. So I'll just go ahead and add like a square here and I'll say like rate limiting. Typically you'll have like a, again, you could have like a middleware function or you could have like some custom thing that you call to say when a user makes this request, make sure they're authenticated. Secondly, look at their user ID and store how many times they have made this request, right? Every time they try to make that request, you store it somewhere. Sometimes you can store it in Redis, you can store it in your database, you could do like an in-memory cache. Doesn't matter, store it somewhere so that if the user ID of Bob has made 10,000 requests in the past two seconds, maybe you should just ban them. Maybe you should log something, disable their account, and just stop letting them do requests, okay? So you do want rate limiting in front of all your API endpoints, and you should probably have like a, a generic, hey, like if you're an authenticated user, you can maybe do 10 requests every uh, 30 seconds, or like, you know, you have to play around with it. But what you're trying to prevent is one person from basically pulling your whole service down to a halt because he found one endpoint that kind of computes pi to the 1000th place and he wants to just you know really destroy your stuff so rate limiting very important now something that i didn't talk about is sometimes you'll have endpoints that are fetching data from the database and that data might have stuff that you should never expose right you might have like a user model and that might have an email on it let me just go ahead and zoom this up a little bit and so let's say you have an endpoint let's just simplify this i'm going to say slash users this is my users endpoint and someone decides that they want to just request all the users in your system, you want to make sure that you have something in place, whether that's like a data transfer object here, typically it's called a DTO, where the data that comes back from the database, you want to strip out email or in your query itself, or let's say you're using an ORM or you're writing SQL, you want to make sure that you have a select statement and you only select the fields that you actually need because a that's just going to improve the performance of your system if you're not fetching back a bunch of unrelated data from your database then don't do it but also it's protecting because if you were to leak all of your emails for all your users let's say you had like a social security number stored in here that's not something you want one person to be able to fetch in view okay so you want some type of thing in place and typically you can have like a data transfer object between your actual like application logic this could be your business logic you want something in place that like just makes it a little bit harder for a developer to accidentally, oops, I just leaked all the social security numbers of all my users, right? You want something in place that like prevents that from happening. And you can do that at the front of your business logic. You could do that between your business logic and the persistence layer. But there's just stuff like this that you need to think about of everything I fetch from the database. Should a public user be able to see this? Should a non-associated user be able to see this? Sometimes you'll have data that an admin might be able to see, but a normal user can't see, but they both have access to that thing, right? They both have access to the table, but there's certain things in that table, like certain columns that certain users just shouldn't be able to update or view. And then you either add those constraints in your business logic, or if you have like a, a special database that has like row level security or column level security, like you can like encode that in your database. But again, the idea is like, you need to make sure that you're not leaking information that users shouldn't be seeing. So these are all the things that you need to think about when you're kind of building an API or a server or using Next.js is A, if someone wants to kind of destroy my system, did I add rate limiting? Do I have authentication checks in place? Do I have authorization checks in place? Do I have some type of code in place to prevent me leaking information on accident? And also do I have sanitation in place to prevent them from storing bad code into my database that might be later pulled and displayed in the UI? And then am I also doing input validation to make sure that the data that they're trying to store actually matches like the expected data properties or the, the data types that I would expect. So I know I just like went on a long tangent and talked about a lot of stuff, but these are things you have to think about constantly when you're building out a backend or just building out an application in general is always assume everything you write is going to be abused by a script kitty or a hacker and everything single thing that's coming in and out of your back end. Like you have to think about what happens if someone were to make a billion requests to this endpoint. Will my server stay up or will it crash? All right, that's all I wanted to talk about. I hope you guys learned something new from watching me ramble about securing your 
applications. If you did, give me a thumbs up and leave a comment. Have a good day. Happy coding.